have been many great relationships throughout the years. For example, there's Bonnie and Clyde, Romeo and Juliet, Taylor and Travis. And who is this Taylor person? Why is Travis with him? I don't, I don't know. In addition to this, there have also been many bad relationships throughout the years. For example, we have Whitney and Bobby. We have Tina and I. We also have Wales and England. Yes, Wales and England, that old relationship which has never been too great. It's had some warmer moments, I guess. <laughs> But it's, it's been in a rough patch for, say, I don't know, about a thousand years. And throughout this long, tumultuous relationship, there have been many low moments. In fact, when deciding which moments to use in this video, I couldn't really narrow it down to three or five. I had to stick to ten, and even then, there's some which I left out, which I, I think are very important. Anyway, here are ten of the lowest moments in the historic relationship between Wales and England. Quick disclaimer, this list is in no particular order so just keep that in mind. Number 10. Mining disasters. The history of mining in Wales includes several tragic accidents where the safety of Welsh miners and innocent people was sometimes neglected by English mine owners. We all are familiar with the story of Aberfan. We don't need to cover that too in depth here. But essentially, 116 children and 28 adults were killed because of a accident caused by the National Coal Board, an English-owned mining company. Additionally, Additionally, there's also the less talked about Sanghenev Colliery disaster, which killed 439 miners and a rescuer. It's the worst mining accident in the United Kingdom, not just Wales. So as you can see, there have been many mining incidents. And this leads us on to number nine, the exploitation of Welsh natural resources. During the Industrial Revolution, Wales was heavily exploited for its natural resources, particularly coal and iron, often to the benefit of English industrialists. We have a whole of a video on Wales during the Industrial Revolution, so we're not going to go too in-depth again here, but we will say that it's relatively noteworthy that England and the United Kingdom were exploiting many countries during the Industrial Revolution, from India to Ireland to Wales, and plenty of us too. So it's no great surprise that Wales was heavily used for its resources during this time, and the effects still remain today. You can still see in South Wales, for example, some of the old coal fields, the ironworks. If you go to North Wales, you can see slate mines, you can see all kinds of remnants of this industrial past. And when people say, oh, Wales is unable to be independent because it can't provide for itself, well, it provided for England and a whole global empire, so I'm pretty sure it can thrive with just 3.5 million people. Number eight, language suppression. Throughout history, there have been efforts to suppress the Welsh language, including the imposition of English in schools and official documents. Many in Wales were Will have been taught about the Welsh knot, which was a way of punishing school children in Wales for speaking their native tongue. If a child in a Welsh school was caught speaking Welsh, they would have to wear this Welsh knot around their neck. Very classy England. The Welsh knot was used in schools as early as 1798 and was used throughout the early 1800s and as late as the 1870s and early 20th century. So the next time an English person goes, Oh, tip tip, my friend. Yes, the Welsh language is dead in Wales. You're all speak English anyway. <laughs> Just remember that the reason everyone here speaks English and only a minority speak Welsh, it's because of the English government imposing suppression laws on Wales. Speaking of the English government and kings with suppression laws, number seven takes a look at Henry VIII and the infamous Laws in Wales Act of 1535. The Laws in Wales Act of 1535, sometimes referred to as the Act of Union, was a significant piece of legislation during the reign of King Henry VIII of England. It's a crucial part of Welsh history for a number of reasons. Firstly, the annexation of Wales to England. This act formally annexed Wales to the Kingdom of England, abolishing the legal entity of the Principality of Wales, as it was then referred. This meant that Wales was no longer considered as a separate political identity, but rather part of the English realm. So essentially, Wales ceased to be a country. It was now part of England, kind of like our poor friends Cornwall. Legal and administrative changes. The act saw 
law to standardize legal and administrative practices in Wales with those in England. English law was to be applied uniformly throughout both nations, eroding the distinctive legal traditions that Wales had maintained. It also banned the Welsh language in courts, in schools, in everywhere. The creation of the Council of Wales and the Marches. The Act established the Council of Wales and the Marches as a central administrative body responsible for governing Wales. This council, however, was often seen as a means of English control rather than a representation of Welsh interests, which goes without saying because the whole act of union was the whole means of English control. This led to the loss of autonomy in Wales, which of course is terrible and the effects are still felt to this day. It furthered the cultural suppression both in language and culture. It confiscated land, so the act facilitated the confiscation of Welsh lands by English authorities. Again, terrible. Administrative challenges, the creation of the Council of Wales and the Marches was intended to streamline governance, but it often resulted in administrative challenges. The council was primarily staffed by English officials, leading to decisions that did not always align with the best interests of the Welsh population. Can you see the point here, people? The whole purpose of this act was to subjugate Wales into England and erase Wales as even having existed. Lastly, there was the social and economic disparities. The act exacerbated social and economic disparities between Wales and England. Economic resources were often exploited for the benefit of English interests, contributing to the economic challenges faced by the Welsh population. So again, this act is easily one of the 10 worst things to ever happen to Wales. Again, the effects are felt to this day, and independence arguments are primarily fueled by things like this. Number six, religious suppression. Religious suppression in Wales has been a historical phenomenon that unfolded over centuries, with various episodes of tension, conflict, and more between different religious traditions, much like the rest of the world. While it's essential to recognize that the dynamics of religious suppression were multifaceted, one notable period was during the Acts of Uniformity in the 16th and 17th centuries. And no, the Acts of Uniformity is not why we wear school uniforms in schools. The Acts of Uniformity were a series of acts designed to make Wales conform to the English national religion, which was Anglicanism. Wales had a strong tradition of non-conformity, with many adherents to Puritism and other dissenting religious movements. The Acts of Uniformity aimed at suppressing these non-conformist traditions, resulting in the expulsion of ministers and the restriction of alternative forms of worship. The Acts of Uniformity contributed to the marginalization of Welsh language worship. The insistence on using the Book of Common Prayer in English excluded those who preferred worship in Welsh, further eroding cultural and linguistic practices. The Acts of Uniformity centralized religious control in England, diminishing local autonomy in matters of worship and church governance. This centralization was felt keenly in Wales, where religious practices had historically been intertwined with local cultural and linguistic identities. Lastly, the ejection of non-conformist ministers had economic and social repercussions in Welsh communities. It disrupted established religious practices, led to the loss of local leaders, and created divisions within communities. So, in short, the Acts of Uniformity played a role in religious suppression in Wales by seeking to enforce conformity with English religious practices. And this led to the birth of the Church of Wales, which is essentially the Church of England, but with a different name. So, yes, this is number six on the list. Number five, Welsh plantations. During the Tudor period especially, particularly under Henry VIII, there were efforts to implant English settlers in Wales, altering the demographic and cultural landscape of the country. Essentially, English people were to move to Wales and to turn it English. The effects of this practice are still visible in Wales today, specifically the practice of plantations during the Edwardian conquest of Wales. You know, Edward I, Longshanks, that horrible, horrible man who couldn't capture Scotland. That they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! In Wales, King Edward I of England began a policy of constructing a chain of fortifications and castles in North Wales to control the native Welsh population. This is, again, still visible today. If you go to Conwy, you'll see Conwy Castle. Go to Carnarvon, you'll see Carnarvon Castle, and so forth. And this was a practice used not just in Wales, but also in Ireland during the Tudor and Stuart eras, particularly. And the English crown initiated a large-scale colonization of Ireland, in particular the province of Ulster, with Protestant settlers from Great Britain. Similar thing happened in Wales and the effects are still visible to this day and it remains one of the worst things to happen to Wales because it is a large reason why the Welsh culture and language has suffered so severely. Yes, we have no problems with English people coming to move to Wales. In fact, the more the merrier. But there should be respect, there should be tolerance and there shouldn't be the complete erasure of Wales. Four, the title of Prince of Wales. So long before William, the current Prince,
Prince of Wales and King Charles III, who was the holder of the Prince of Wales title for a very long time. Long before these two, there was an actual Prince of Wales from Wales. And the most notorious, perhaps, is the last Prince of Wales, also called Cwellyn the Last. So in the annals of Welsh history, the life and death of Cwellyn ap Griffith, also known as Cwellyn the Last, stands as a tragic chapter marked by political intrigue, betrayal, and a gruesome post humus fate. Llewellyn the Last was the last native Prince of Wales and a valiant leader who struggled to maintain Welsh independence in the face of English encroachment. However, his efforts were ultimately crushed by the ruthless, aforementioned King Edward I of England. Longshanks. The life of Huellen the Last can be its own video in itself, so again, we're not going to go too in depth here. However, what needs to be known is that essentially there was a war between England and Wales, and England won. King Edward I of England won, and Huellen the Last was decapitated. His head was cut off, it was placed at the Tower of London for a long time, not only to humiliate Huellen the Last, but also to humiliate Wales. In fact, this was was a mockery of the ancient Welsh mythological tradition that a Welsh prince or king would be crowned the king of Britain in London. And of course, this was done to mock him. A crown of ivy was even placed around his head to further mock the tradition. So yeah, the English king, Edward I, was a bit of a bastard, wasn't he? The Romans were bastards. And probably in more ways than one, knowing how the English royals tended to breed. But anyway, I digress because I'm going off topic. This victory for Edward, often named as the English Conquest of Wales, resulted in the title Prince of Wales becoming something of a further mockery of Wales and its former traditions because the title of Prince of Wales would be given to the son of the king or queen as a sort of kingly waiting list. It's given to the heir to the throne which is why Charles, the current king, had it so long. And they would hold on to this title of Prince of Wales, despite not being Welsh or even living in Wales in most cases. And they would keep hold of it until they become king. And then they discard the Prince of Wales title aside and the next in line to the throne is the one to claim it. And then they suddenly gain a pretend interest in Wales, Welsh, etc. For example, William, despite having always known he was going to one day be the Prince of Wales, has only just announced that he's going to learn Welsh. It seems rather convenient that he is only just learning now that he has the title instead of taking an interest before when he knew he was going to be the Prince of Wales one. Anyway, I, I digress. It's it's bad. Prince of Wales title is bad, okay? Number three, the Taff Vale case of 1901. The Taff Vale case was a landmark legal decision in the United Kingdom that had significant implications for trade unions and workers' rights. It took place in 1901 and involved the Taff Vale Railway Company and the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants, or the ASRS, if you can't say amalgam. It took me three attempts. In the late 19th century and the early 20th century, trade unions in the UK were becoming increasingly powerful and industrial disputes were common. The Taff Vale Railway Company, based in Wales, of course, was faced with a strike organised by the ASRS in 1900 over issues related to pay and working conditions. During the strike, the ASRS called for a boycott of the Taff Vale Railway, hoping to exert pressure on the company to meet their demands. The strike was ultimately unsuccessful and the company suffered financial losses. Following the strike, the Taff Vale Railway Company took legal action against the ASRS, seeking damages for the losses incurred during the boycott. The case went to the court, and in 1901, the House of Lords delivered judgment in favour of the railway company over the union. The House of Lords ruled that trade unions could be held liable for damages resulting from the actions of its members. This decision had far-reaching consequences because it meant that trade unions could be sued for financial losses suffered by employers during strikes and other industrial actions. The Taff Vale case had a profound impact on the trade union movement in the UK. It weakened the position of trade unions by making them financially vulnerable to legal action. The ruling essentially nullified the effectiveness of one of the primary tools in a trade union arsenal, the strike. Now, on the bright side, this led to the growth of the Labour Party, as it then was, back when it was actually a real functioning Labour Party and not whatever it is now. Jeez, did I just make a political comment? Oops. And it's a large part of this and the aforementioned mining accidents and all the industrialism that occurred in Wales during this time that Wales today is such a labour stronghold and it's such a, a left-wing nation. So the Taff Vale case remains one of the worst instances in Welsh history simply because it was an attack by the English Parliament or the House of Lords, one above the Parliament. It was an attack by them on the Welsh people, the working Welsh people. And this has become a common theme in history because Welsh workers 
workers are often viewed by the English aristocracy as being stupid and they live in the mine, they die in the mine and so forth. So yes, this is one of the worst cases. Number two, the Statute of Rivland. The Statute of Rivland, also known as the Statute of Wales, were a series of laws enacted by Edward I of England between 1277 and 1284. Notice how Edward I always comes up in the bad things of Wales. It's a coincidence. These statutes played a crucial role in the annexation of Wales by England and had significant implications for the governance and administration of the Welsh territories. So after the defeat of Hwelyn ap Griffith, the last native prince of Wales, as we mentioned before, in 1282, Edward I sought to consolidate his control over Wales. The Statute of Rivland was part of a broader legal and administrative framework designed to integrate Wales into the Kingdom of England, which of course fully happened when Henry VIII was... You know, we, we've already been there. We don't need to continue zoning in on this guy's stupid face. English common laws in Wales. So the statutes imposed English common laws in Wales, replacing Welsh legal customs and traditions. This was a significant shift in the legal landscape of Wales. Additionally, the statutes divided Wales into shires and counties instead of the former a principality as it was, and introduced English-style counties, sheriffalities, and local administrations. The administrative reorganisation aimed to strengthen English control over Welsh territories. The statutes introduced English inheritance laws affecting land ownership and the transfer of property in Wales. This had implications for Welsh aristocracy and landowners. Edward I also initiated the construction of a network of castles across Wales, including notable structures such as Conwy or Carnarvon, as we mentioned in the last video. These castles served both military and administrative purposes, symbolizing English dominance, which can still be seen to this day. The statutes encouraged the adoption of the English language and customs. English was promoted in official and legal matters, further diminishing the status of the Welsh language. The statutes created legal distinctions between the newly conquered territories in Wales and existing counties in England. This reinforced the subordinate status of Wales within the English legal system. So ultimately, the Statute of Rudlin centralized control over Wales, eroding the autonomy that that Welsh rulers had previously enjoyed. It contributed to a decline in the use of the Welsh language in official and legal contexts, as English became the dominant language of administration, and the Statute of Rivland had a lasting impact on the legal and administrative structures of Wales. It marked the beginning of a new chapter in Welsh history, characterised by a closer association with England. So as you can see, this statute is very visible to this day. Wales is still seen as a part of England by some, not by all, because many people, even in England, shout out to the good size. Even in England, there are people who recognize Wales as a separate country with its own traditions, its own culture, and its own language. But there are many who don't, especially in Parliament. Jacob Rees-Mogg, we're looking at you, and it continues to be a problem to this day, and hopefully one day the problem will end. So yes, the Statute of Rivlan is one of the worst, and we hope one day the statute will be destroyed. Anyway, we finally made it to number one. Thank you if you're still here. Number one. The Edwardian Conquest of Wales. So we've mentioned Edward I plenty in this video already and in the previous video. And there's a reason for that. It's because many of the problems Wales has faced over the centuries can cite the Edwardian Conquest as the root cause of these same problems. So we're not going to go and explain everything that happened in the Edwardian Conquest. This video has gone on long enough already. But we can look at some of the immediate aftermath. So after the victory by Edward was the statute of Rivlin, which we just mentioned, in 1284. Immediately after this, there was castle building and military presence. Edward I's ambitious castle building program left a lasting physical legacy. Again, we can see it to this day. There was a social and cultural impact. The conquest had a profound impact on Welsh society. The Welsh aristocracy, as it then was, faced displacement. The imposition of English had land. Tenure systems affected patterns of land ownership. The Welsh language, while not completely eradicated, as it's still here to this day, faced challenges as as English became the dominant language in official and legal matters. Most importantly, it was the end of Welsh independence. The conquest marked the end of Welsh independence and the era of native Welsh princes. The title Prince of Wales, as mentioned, became a symbolic gesture granted to the heir apparent of the English monarch, and it has continued in this tradition to the present day. It led to struggles for autonomy. You know, despite the conquest, there are periodic uprisings and struggles for Welsh autonomy in the subsequent centuries. Figures like Owain Glyndwr in the 15th century led revolts against English rule, 
Though these efforts were ultimately unsuccessful, and this is why we're still a part of Britain, or the United Kingdom, I should say, to this day. There was a cultural persistence of resilience. Despite the political and administrative changes, Welsh culture and identity persisted, but it has been strangled by the United Kingdom or English culture for almost a millennia. It's a long time, and it's been one big problematic issue that Welsh and Welsh culture is being eradicated, and it's still visible. And lastly, there was the Acts of Union in 1536 and 1543. You know, this was partly created, like the first brick of the building of the Act of Union was planted by Edward III on his conquest of Wales. So the Edwardian conquest of Wales was a transformative event that reshaped the relationship between Wales and England. To some, might be a good thing. To others, it's a terrible thing. And it's probably the worst thing England has done. England, not the people, the king, is the worst thing England has has done to Wales, and that's why it's number one on this list, which was not done in order, but yet this ended up number one. Anyway, if you would like to follow us on Facebook, please do. We are there under the name facebook.com forward slash collective histories page, and if you go to Instagram, we are there too at instagram.com forward slash the collective histories, and you can subscribe to us on YouTube. We are desperate for your subscriptions. Please stay, stay with me. Thank you. Have a lovely day and watch out for Edward the First. He is a bastard.